things there. Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is our first uh, FSB uh, London Net Zero Roundtable event, first of a three part series, and it's great to have you here. Um, it's really important to us that uh, we have this event running. Um, it's important to me personally because uh, green and environmental sustainability issues are very close to my heart and have always been. And it's great that our, uh, our London policy group uh, on environment and sustainability has managed to pull this together. So thanks to all of them. Of course, thank you to Sarah King, who's uh, been supporting this, and to Dominique, who's enabled us to get it all online and running at the right time, sort of. We apologize for being a couple of minutes late. Um, obviously, from a, uh, a net zero perspective, it's, it's really important for us to be dealing with this uh, in the build-up now, the three weeks away till we get into COP26. And uh, obviously everybody who's here knows about COP26 because that's why you're here. Um, but it's how we respond to that as a small business community here in London. Um, we've been hearing for the past years that our country wants to be net zero by 2050, thanks to our prime minister and government saying that, and, um, and the GLA talking about net zero by 2030 in London, and is that going to be possible? And what does that mean for small businesses? And how are small businesses going to be part of that net zero journey? And this, our, um, our series of roundtables of, of for tonight, for today and the next two weeks. That's going to be part of that. So it's really exciting that we've been able to pull this together and to move forward on our net zero journey. Uh, the FSB has been very involved in this for the past several years, and we've been involved in uh, ULES consultations with the, uh, the GLC, uh, GLC, GLA, and um, it shows how old I am. And been, we, uh, I was very proud to be part of the original um, uh, EV, the Electric Vehicle Task Force, which was several years ago, that was again initiated by the mayor. Um, we've been involved in a whole range of different lobbying work uh, within um, London and we're really proud about some of our achievements. So it's great that we're all here and it's great that you're all here. And it's, uh, it's now a great pleasure for me to introduce Paul, Paul Wilson, who is the policy director, head of policy uh, with the FSB. And he's gonna to talk to us for a short while about our sustainability update within the FSB. Over to you, Paul. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Michael. And uh, thank you for involving me this morning. It's really good to be here. As you can imagine, Net Zero is something that we're talking an awful lot about at the moment. Um, so who am I? I'm the FSB's policy director. So I'm on the staff side working at a national level. Um, and we are planning a significant policy report very shortly on Net Zero, um, hopefully to roughly coincide with COP. Uh, so we recently surveyed FSB members on Net Zero. For those of you who are aware, we have our big voice panel. Um, please do register for it if you're not already registered, because it allows you to have a say on a variety of policy issues and make sure that your voice is heard by, by the national government. So we recently surveyed that panel on Net Zero. And I'm just going to talk about some of the things that came out of that survey and give a bit of a sort of a sneak preview of what's likely to be covered in the report itself. So, I mean, the headlines are that the majority of FSB members very much do believe there is a climate crisis ongoing at the moment. And I think Michael spoke about the sort of political um, backing for the net zero agenda. And what I would say is, yes, you know, it's a big priority for this government, but actually there's a, there's a cross party consensus more or less on, on, on net zero, maybe differences of opinion in terms of exactly the policies and the approach as to how to get there. But the question of do we need to decarbonize and decarbonize fast is there's pretty well a consensus over. So this is a, a crucial issue, not just for this year, not just for next year, but for literally the next 30 years. So, um, but the headline, like I say, is the majority of members do believe there's a climate crisis. However, only around a third of uh, small businesses have a plan and have taken steps towards net zero. So there's obviously a lot more to do. We have members who are doing a lot of really good things. So micro generation, quite a lot of members doing micro generation. Apparently solar panels are much more popular than heat pumps. 
at the moment, which is a bit of a surprise to me as a look out of the window at the dreary conditions. Um, but but that's that's encouraging on the solar panel side of things. And impressively, we have we have a significant but small proportion of members who are already planning really ambitious steps. So we've got members who are planning already planning to you know have an entire fleet of electric vehicles by 2030, for example, which you know is is a really ambitious and good and good plan. But this is net zero, so of course much more action will be will be needed. And um, the government often talks about things like a race race to net zero. And the way I think about it is if it is a race to net zero, then big business has a heck of a head start here because they've been, you know, regulated in this space for the last 15, 20 years and small businesses are, are really having to try and play catch up. So I think it's incredibly important that FSB has a really strong voice in the policy debate that we can feed into government. What are the barriers that small businesses currently face? And there are a number of them and that we see meaningful policy action taken on that. So what are some of those barriers that we're hearing our members are facing as they look to move towards net zero well i mean an obvious one is time you know all small business owners are very time poor and unfortunately that's not going away and the number of pressures and other worries that have come up in the last year have just been absolutely unprecedented obviously the pandemic but and we're still you know seeing the 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 effects as we as furlough comes to an end and the economy starts to adjust, skills shortages, difficulties recruiting in the labour market more broadly. We've got a run on petrol recently, gas prices going up. There's so many pressures um, that business owners are under. And we're very extremely aware that net zero is another thing that a very busy person has to turn has to turn their mind to. So time and you know sort of bandwidth is definitely one one issue information is another we know that less than one in ten of our members have measured their carbon footprint which is you know unsurprising but around three quarters want more information on this so that's definitely something that we can quite quickly help with and then there's some more practical barriers that we're hearing about so you know looking at low carbon transport and electric vehicles lack of charging infrastructure is one that keeps on coming up again and again and again um, and is one that we were we were talking to government ministers about just earlier this week. Uh, poor public transport in some areas is another barrier. If you're just looking to avoid having to make that journey in your car, you need reasonable public transport options. That's not always available. And actually, that's not just a net zero issue at all. That is a, a levelling up issue, if you want to put it in another of the sort of government's big priority areas. And then you've got some perverse incentives there in in the system so the one that um i'll i'll refer to now is around business rates the fact that if you want to uh invest in making a low carbon improvement to your to your business property then actually that may end up being penalized by increasing your rateable value increasing your tax bill and i feel like in principle it's long been understood that the tax system should reward low carbon not penalize it so that is a, a glaring anomaly and we really hope and expect and are arguing for the government to take action on that as they go through their fundamental and we do hope it is fundamental review of business rates so like i say we're working up a report that will showcase all of that and we'll highlight other policy recommendations uh, to the government i also wanted to flag up two other things that the fsb is doing by way of support first the fsb sustainability hub so this should have a lot of useful content to help members understand the sustainability arena, not just net zero, but more broadly. Um, it should have links to FSB events and our full day conference that's coming up in November. So do please look out for that and register if you're interested. It links to the government's Pledge to Zero campaign and we'll keep on developing the hub as we go on. on. So uh, including providing hopefully practical information on the support that is available if you do want to make make changes within your business. One other thing to flag up is the Zero Carbon portal. So that's zerocarbonbusiness.uk. Again, it's another website. It's been put together by a sort of um, coalition of bodies of which the FSB is one, the other B5 big business representative organisations, energy networks, etc. put this together. It's currently in beta phase, but it really has tons of information on practical steps you can take. And if you have a look at it, they're looking for feedback. Uh, via the website so they can keep on keep on improving it so again that's another resource that's there to really hopefully 
provide practical and useful help to help you make those next steps on your journey towards net zero. So otherwise, I'm really keen to hear comments and questions today. I'm very much in listening mode. I don't profess to be an expert in, in this space. And I know that there's much more that FSB can and will be doing around this. But for now, that's it from me. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I'm really intrigued by this idea that uh, the race to net zero and we're lagging behind the small business sector is lagging behind big business. But I think we're more flexible and we're more dynamic and we're able to make the changes more quickly than big business. So I think that we we might be able to play catch up really quickly on this. Um, please do use the Q&A function at the, at the bottom of the screen. But we've had one comment already, which is, uh, why only net zero? Why not go for net? I says net negative. I thought it was net positive, but uh, we know what we mean. But you know, uh, being a being positive, I I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Paul. Um, well, I mean, ideally, yes. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure that is a good aspiration. And of course, I'm not a climate science expert, but. Um, you know, if you if you could get net negative, uh, and it must be possible for some, then it, it it will help with keeping global temperature rises down. So so yeah, one why why not? But um, break it down into bite sized steps at the same time as well. I would say. I, I think for the micro business who can who can make the assessments of their of their carbon output, I think it might be easier for them to do it uh, than for larger companies. But I think this is a, it's a really exciting prospect that if if we're looking at net zero by 2030 in London, well, maybe small businesses, micro business could be net zero by 2025 and then have five years to work on actually being positive in terms of their carbon output. Have we got any questions for Paul at this stage? Okay, there's a silence there. So uh, I'm sure that we'll come back on to you. So thanks very much, uh, Paul, for your input so far and see what's coming up afterwards. Um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Sat Pillai. Um, it's a great pleasure because not only is he hugely experienced and very knowledgeable about uh, what he's going to talk about, which is uh, primarily the circular economy, but he's also one of our own. He's one of our members. He's uh, the chair of the London uh, Policy Group on Environment and Sustainability, and he's been very, very active, not just with us, but within uh, wider organisations, and he's sat on uh, panels before, and he's going to present to us uh, about his work. So over to you, Sat. Okay, can you hear me? You're on. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the handover, Michael, and thanks for everyone attending this really important uh, session. I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. Hopefully, you can see a slide. First off, I should say I'm not an eco warrior. Uh, I'm not from Extinction Rebellion or from Insulate UK or any of those kinds of organizations. Um, and my own business circled up helps a larger organization, in fact, get over chaos. Um, the chaos of big initiatives in fewer meetings, calls, and emails. And we ensure a much better outcome using our technology. Now, hopefully you can see uh, what's on the slides, but to mix things up a bit, what I've done over the years is to get involved in environmental issues. And I suppose it's become a bit of a hobby for me because I faced a stark change in my own environment as a kid. I moved from a little green town in Southern India to a big gray city in the UK called London, only to learn from TV programs like Newsround that I was breathing in lead in exhaust fumes on my walk to school and my eyes were stinging because of acid rain coming in from Scandinavia and now uh, 40 years on things are about to get a lot worse globally uh, we're going to be facing uh, all sorts of challenges in the climate emergency from more pandemics as species start transmitting more viruses because they're losing their habitats and start cohabiting with ours and then mass migration of people from regions that become flooded or become deserts. And getting to global net zero carbon emissions is going to be the only way to stop this uh, downward spiral. And institutions such as the UN and the EU have divided up this global mission across all countries. Big banks and investment funds are shifting where they put our money. And as usual, small businesses are an afterthought. But I'm here to share that over the next five minutes or so that we are the elephant in the room and we hold a golden key. 
and, and that's the circular economy. Why are we the elephant in the room? Well, as this chart shows of uh, businesses by London boroughs, um, micro, small and medium sized businesses collectively are much bigger, much, much bigger than large businesses together. We make up over 99% of businesses, over 60% of employment and over 50% of revenues in London. And those same percentages are, tr are true across the UK. So small businesses rule, right? Or at least we should rule. But we know that we don't have the resources of large companies and our needs are often ignored. For example, some of the issues that Paul mentioned, but also late payment of invoices or being given a fair chance of winning bids from larger companies. And as, as Paul mentioned, also the setting of business, business rates. The issue is that it is very difficult for small and medium sized enterprises to rule in our 200 year old linear economy. In other words, one in which we extract limited natural resources from the earth, produce resources that people want to buy, use those resources, and then once we're done with it, we throw them somewhere out of sight. However, if we reused, reduced, and even refused to use those resources, we'd begin to rebalance that linear economy more in our favor. And that's a linear engine that large companies have built. Meanwhile, if we worked with the large businesses to have these resources repaired, refurbished, and remanufactured, we'd help them produce products and services that are built to last, rather than simply becoming obsolete and forcing us to buy another one. And if we recycled and repurposed these resources at the end of their life cycles, we'd help us all become much more resource efficient. And by doing so, large businesses would be incentivized or forced to reduce the use of the limited natural resources that we have by design. And all of these steps collectively cut down on carbon emissions and together we get to have an equal voice in a new circular economy. This model is now gaining huge momentum with the UN and the EU pushing this transition across the globe. And I'll give a few more examples, but my time I think is up and I'll hand over back to Michael. Thank you. So that's amazing. I love that diagram. And I think it's really powerful to, to see it like that and sort of relatively looking so simple and why we can't just all log into this straight away um, is, a, is, a, is a big question that has to be asked. Um, Christopher has asked a question. So, I mean, I, this is more, more general, I suppose, but on top of reducing our carbon outputs to zero, we could offset even more, say through sponsoring reforestation and other offset programs. Is that part of this model or is that something different? So that's something different. And one of the um, concerns with using these offsetting um, programs is that it is simply taking with one hand or giving with one hand and taking with the other, right? What we want to do is, as Christopher said earlier on, is to get to net negative. So it's a good thing in terms of rebalancing and getting towards zero. But what we really have to do is get companies to cut down on the sort of taking with the one hand kind of issue, which is we need to cut down on the emissions themselves and not just uh, offset them. Well, just to chip in on that, I, I think Christopher's just sort of explaining the net negative question from earlier, as in you don't just reduce, but you go even further, and that's what net, net negative is. So, so it's absolutely. So, Paul, what you're actually saying there is that that this model that you're showing us on the screen set is our journey to net zero, and actually the way that we then supplement that, the icing on the cake, if you like, is reforestation and other net, uh, offset programs. Is, would that be correct? Yes, I would agree with that, yes. And, and the circular economy is just one of the um, tools that we can use to get to net zero or net ne negative. Um, you know, there are other things like just sort of focusing on uh, plastics elimination uh, and so on and so forth. And this model that you're saying is, is, is propagated by the UN, 
uh, is it why I've not seen this one before is it widely available and where where can people pick it up from apart from from you I mean this is yeah. so I, I pulled this off of the UN Environment Programme online um, I think I, I've actually done some training as well with the UN um, their staff college and this is one of the models that they presented to us okay all right at the beginning of your talk uh, there are no questions that are coming in at this moment so I just I've got a question for you really which is uh, at the beginning of the talk you talked about climate emergency um Paul talked about climate crisis you know we've we've moved very rapidly from climate change and and global warming to these more extreme uh, this extreme language and you also talked about um mass migrations and so on and so on um, in terms of the work that you do, how real a threat are those things? Because I think that that's one of the things that we need to be responding to, the reality of this threat, because it's really important that we put these into perspective. Yeah, so on a day-to-day -day basis, the work that we do is focus more with large organisations and, and getting them to either change the way they, th they do things internally or between large organizations or, or across a supply chain or across an ecosystem or, of organizations. In terms of some of the, we, so we don't have firsthand experience of some of the out, the, the very real outcomes that are happening already in terms of migration, right? There's, in the old days, so to speak, people migrated uh, because of sort of uh, folks being economic migrants and looking for a better um, um, uh, standard of living or something like that. But now it's like people are fleeing their places because, they, it, because of um, emergencies, not just climate, but political emergencies and so on. So it's a, slow, it's a vastly different situation now. And that's only gonna increase if climate, and, and, and it will, if climate is added to this picture of uh, political instability. And political instability happens partly and because of inequities in that region. And some of the inequities are multiplied by climate change. That's, that's really interesting when you put it like that. I mean, I was reading a figure that, uh, you know, we struggled in Europe to accommodate several million uh, refugees recently uh, from the Middle East. And they're talking about 100 million people will be displaced in the next 15 years if we don't make a change. So I think that that's a real stark uh, statistic. So that's great. Has anyone got any questions for Sat? Well, thank you, Sat. And you know, I, I, and I, I forgot to um, to mention, of course, that you've now become the national policy lead uh, as well. So it's great for us in London that you've come via uh, London member through London Policy Lead, and now you're on the national team. So it's brilliant. So congratulations on that. Okay, let's move on. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Ben. Uh, ben Connor is the senior policy and programs officer. Uh, uh, with green infrastructure at the GLA and Ben is going to talk to us about um, the GLA and its response which we've mentioned about before so over to you Ben. Thanks a lot Michael I'm just going to get my slides up can people see those slides yeah okay excellent um, so yeah, thank you Michael for the intro and uh, thank you to Sarah for the invitation to speak as well um, so I'm going to talk, I guess, about um, kind of the other side of the coin with climate change. We've heard quite a bit about mitigation and net zero. And I'm going to talk a bit about adapting to climate change and specifically about the role that green infrastructure has to play in this. So I'll talk about how we're approaching this at City Hall at the GLA and talk a bit about the tools that we have in place in terms of policy, planning and guidance, and then about some of our funding and some examples of projects that we've supported. And I should say that Whilst green infrastructure is really important for adapting to climate change, um, it's not the only uh, aspect of that adaptation. But firstly, why, why talk about adaptation and not just mitigation? Um, so as this timeline shows, climate change isn't something in the future, it is, it's here now. So these are all events that have happened in London in the last, uh, last kind of couple of decades. So even if we achieved net zero tomorrow, we'd still have several decades of inevitable warming due to past emissions. And extreme weather events are happening more frequently, as I'm sure everyone has seen, with flash flooding this summer in London, and our city is not yet adequately prepared for them. London's particularly vulnerable. Climate change will make flooding more frequent and more severe, it'll threaten our water resources, and it'll increase heat risk as well. And as we've seen this summer, 
we're both not adequately prepared, but also we know that the most disadvantaged Londoners will be most severely affected. So we also know that London is a very green city by both global and national standards. So around half of London is green cover in some form. And a lot of that is due to a legacy of strong protection for formal green spaces, parks and nature reserves. We also know that this greenery is very unevenly distributed and the pandemic has really brought this into sharp focus. And we know that black, Asian and minority ethnic Londoners and more deprived Londoners are less likely to have access to either public or private green space. We also know that the green spaces we have aren't necessarily designed to provide the functions and the benefits that we need in the context of a changing climate. So in this context, in this policy area at the GLA, we focus on promoting green infrastructure. And what we mean by that is a network of green and blue, so including those water spaces, spaces. This network of green and blue spaces designed and managed to deliver a range of benefits for all Londoners. And when we talk about green infrastructure, we don't just mean traditional parks and nature reserves, also rivers, canals, but also those green elements of the built environment, street trees, green roofs, living walls, sustainable drainage features that collectively have a key role to play as a critical infrastructure in the city to help us adapt to climate change. And those, that green infrastructure provides multiple benefits, mitigating flooding by reducing surface water runoff, cooling the urban environment, both at a citywide scale, but also providing local shade, improving air and water quality, encouraging walking and cycling and healthy living, and supporting nature and biodiversity as well. So green infrastructure is vital in helping to build our resilience to climate change, but also delivering a host of different benefits, which is ultimately about increasing Londoners' health and well-being. And we know that these benefits are significant. So taking just one aspect of London's green infrastructure, its trees or its urban forest, a study that we did found that London's trees prevent 10 times the volume of the serpentine in Hyde Park from entering the drainage system each year. They store over 2 million tonnes of carbon, um, so significant in terms of um, uh, those kind of offsets we were talking about earlier. And they remove 2,000 tonnes of pollution from the air each year, which is equivalent to about 13% of London's transport emissions. So London's green infrastructure provides us with a wealth of benefits, but in the context of climate change, we needed to do even more. So how are we working on implementing this green infrastructure vision at City Hall? So firstly, in terms of policy, uh, the London Environment Strategy sets out some of our key ambitions and targets. And for green infrastructure, that includes for 50% of London to be green by 2050. So maintaining and slightly increasing what we have now. It also sets a target to increase increased tree canopy cover by 10% in the same time frame. The London plan published this year has strong policies on protecting existing green spaces. But it also requires boroughs to produce a local green infrastructure strategy and introduces a new urban greening factor policy that uses a scoring system to ensure that all major new developments include greening. And where that's high quality and provides multiple benefits, scores more highly. And it's also about ensuring that green infrastructure and climate adaptation is integrated into other policy areas. So, for example, the Met's transport strategy that sets targets for street trees and sustainable urban drainage and includes greener streets as a key element of the healthy streets approach. And tackling both the climate and nature emergency is also at the heart of the plans for London's recovery from COVID-19, where the Green New Deal for London is one of nine missions agreed by the London Recovery Board. And supporting this policy, we've also produced a range of guidance and data to help both us at City Hall, but also other organisations, be that local authorities, businesses and communities, um, to deliver more green infrastructure where it's most needed. So we've recently published new climate risk mapping that you can see on the screen here, that brings together data on the impacts of climate change, for example, flooding or heat risk, with data on vulnerability. So where there's particular high levels of deprivation, or where there are high numbers of older or very young Londoners who are more at risk from things like heat waves. And as you can see there, my office on Union Street is in one of the red areas, which is flagged as being one of the highest risk areas for climate in London for climate change impacts in London. And all this data is freely available for people to look at. And we've also produced a green infrastructure focus map. And that shows a range of social and environmental data showing where there's the greatest need for greening interventions. So, for example, where there's a particular lack of access to open space, but also highlighting the type of interventions that you might prioritise. So is flooding a particular issue or is it air pollution that's a particular issue near you? 
So it doesn't tell people exactly what to do, but it helps to inform decisions and guide priorities. And we're also using this data to inform our own programmes, prioritising projects for funding so that they deliver benefits where they're most needed. We've also published a series of guidance documents and particular relevance um, for some people today might be our sustainable drainage sector guidance, which shows how sustainable drainage can be implemented in a range of different contexts. Um, and that includes retail and commercial districts, as well as schools and hospitals. We've also recently published guidance on things as diverse as running community deep paving projects to a design guide to ensuring that urban greening maximizes the benefits for nature. And then finally, we also have various funding programs to support projects helping to deliver on these green infrastructure and climate adaptation objectives. We have annual funding opportunities for community scale projects, most recently through our, our Grow Back Greener Fund. And the criteria for these funds prioritizes locations that are of high climate risk and with worst access to green space. So just to highlight a few projects we've funded recently that have a particular climate adaptation focus. Here you can see this is the deep paving of the footway in Secker Street near Waterloo. It's part of the Cornwall Road Greenway project led by We Are Waterloo Business Improvement District. And lots of business improvement districts in London are, are really leading this agenda at looking at town centres and high streets and how greening can be integrated into them uh, to benefit both biz businesses, residents and, and people kind of living and working there. And here they removed 100 square metres of hard surfacing, so reducing uh, flood risk, as well as promoting this as a green walking route and uh, getting the community involved in the planting as well. Another example here of a small scale sustainable drainage scheme that was funded here in Enfield. This is integrating greening into the regeneration of the shopping precinct, a redesigned streetscape that included widened pavement, seating and safe pedestrian crossing. This was also part of what we called the London Strategic Sustainable Drainage Pilot Study, which is looking at the benefits of these kind of small distributed interventions in terms of both flood risk, but also there's other co-benefits as well. And finally, as well as these small schemes, we're investing in larger strategic schemes. Um, so currently we have a green and resilient spaces program, and previously had a green capital program. And again, using the data to identify and prioritize where projects can have the most impact. I'm just showing this one because I think it's a, a real kind of Great example, this is Albany Park in Enfield, where the Turkey Brook, the stream you can see here, has been released from a concrete channel into a more natural course, which is protecting hundreds of nearby properties from flooding, whilst at the same time creating a more nature-rich landscape, but also somewhere that Londoners can enjoy, as you can see from the people in the picture. And I'll stop there because I think it's a great example of how green infrastructure can help to tackle climate change, whilst also supporting Londoners well-being, which is exactly the approach that we're looking to encourage from City Hall. But it's not just about these large schemes, integrating more greening into the city at every scale has a really vital role to play. Thank you very much. That's really brilliant, Ben. Thank you very much. It's really exciting to see some of these projects. Um, I, I'm, I'm noticing that people are very slow in coming forward from qu for, with questions, unless Sarah, Dominique, you've seen any that I've missed. But I think that we've, um, yeah, we've got people here to learn rather than to contribute more. Sarah, you've got something to say. Yes, it's not a question, but just obviously seeing the pictures there that um, Ben has shared about Enfield and the, dra the green drainage schemes, which does really sort of help um, prevent with the severe flooding and flash flooding that you know London. Is sort of quite susceptible uh, but I just want to flag up if that's all right an opportunity for our London Enfield members. Um, FSB works very closely with Enfield Council and we're actually hosting uh, with Enfield Council a round table, a green round table on the 10th of November so if you are interested I will just put um, a link to my colleague Matthew Jaffa into the chat so if you are interested please drop him a line we're looking for sort of 10 Enfield businesses to join the call in case there is anybody from Enfield on this call today thank you um Sat do you want to do you, thank you Sarah uh Sat do you want to make your comment directly so oh um yes yeah, so just on concrete actually uh, I think we all noticed that um city centers and, and just just urbanization has, has obviously created a lot of concrete jungles and the water is not able to seep into the ground and, and continue within that water cycle. But also concrete is one of the major carbon emitting industries, concrete manufacture. 
Um, I used to work as a chemical engineer, so I know a little bit about it, but, um, uh, and uh, industries that are trying to, uh, you know, or startups and uh, other organizations are trying to re replace concrete with other materials, uh, less carbon emitting uh, production processes. So that's a, that's a good thing. Yeah, ab absolutely. It, it's a real, it's a real issue. And, you know, it's, it's not just city centers, it's kind of front gardens as well, about half of front gardens in, in London are paved over and it, it all contributes to, to this surface water flood risk, which is often in London, we're pretty well protected for uh, kind of coastal flood risk with the Thames barrier and, and flood risk from rivers, you know, but actually those surface water floods, as we've seen this summer, where you have that really high intensity of rainfall, which is very localized. And with climate change, that's going to be happening more, uh, more and more often. And as you say, the amount of hard surfacing and, and concrete really just kind of acutely uh, kind of raises the risks of that. So the more that we can depave, the more we can uh, increase green cover, um, the more we can tackle uh, those issues. But it often is through these um, small interventions that add up collectively uh, to having a, a larger impact. Thank you. Uh, ben, a question I've got for you, which is directly related to sort of the SME sector, which is, you know, one of your slides show, said that uh, you had local businesses getting involved in the greening of a walkway. Um, if FSB members wanted to be part of initiatives, are there specific initiatives or do these have to be uh, regulated through local authority because a lot of the land will be local authority land that same sort of project that you had there I can't remember where you said it was in Southwark or Waterloo or something yeah um, you know what, what's the process there because I think it'd be really good if we were able to get if our members wanted to be part of such a program how would they get involved yes yeah, so I think there's different options and as you say you know often often it is working with local authorities um what I would say is that lots of the business improvement districts in London have really good programs that are looking at, you know, improve, you know, it's about that place making, isn't it? But greening is a, a really important aspect of that. And, you know, that project was led by uh, We Are Waterloo and, you know, so some of the other ones, you know, just knowing from locally where I work, like uh, Better Bankside and Team London Bridge, they have some really, really good initiatives that and there's lots of opportunities for businesses to get involved in that way. I think as well, you know, talking to local authorities um, is a great way in as, you know, it's kind of flagged the, the initiative to, with opportunity to talk to Enfield and they are definitely a local authority that is doing a lot in this area. But more broadly, I'd say, you know, there's, there's opportunities to get involved with lots of community led projects as well. So we fund lots of community groups to deliver community gardens, um, community food growing projects which are all really important for, you know, both for climate adaptation and nature, but also for, for people's health and well-being. And all of those projects are always looking to get involved with local businesses that have different expertise. It might be contributing some funding or sponsorship. It might be contributing particular knowledge. It might be contributing materials in kind. There's lots and lots of opportunities. Um, and I think as well, um, increasingly um, opportunities for uh, businesses to get involved in things like uh, sponsorship of tree planting. So there's a new scheme called Trees for Streets, uh, which has just recently set up and it's running in about five London boroughs now. Where there are opportunities there for local businesses and for local residents to get involved with both sponsoring and helping to, to look after street trees. Um, so yeah, I think there's lots of different things and I would my recommendation would be to to start locally start start with them um, you know kind of where your business is based brilliant and can you can you share is uh, any of those in have you got any of those in sort of written form that you can share with us that we could share out with our members or is it... yeah so i've sent a few links over to sarah and then she's put a few um a few of those in the chat and I'll, I'll add a few more as well that's brilliant thank you very much it's been really really useful to hear you talking okay what i'd like to do now is i'd like to introduce cameron uh, Cameron Scott uh, is from UK Power Networks and he's an innovation engineer and uh, is going to talk to us about facilitating Net Zero. Cameron, over to you. Awesome. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to get my screen up so I can share it. Um, bear with me one second. And That's good. You're up. There. Yep. Awesome. Yes. Uh, thank you for the introduction, um, Michael. 
and also thank you, Sarah, for the invite. I'm really uh, happy to be here today. Um, so I'm going to chat to you a little bit about one of our initiatives we've got at UK Power Networks at the minute called White Band Plan and how we're helping support SMEs and also a bit about energy efficiencies. So some other projects that uh, we're also doing here. So before jumping into that, uh, just a bit of background about who we are. Uh, and the reason I do this is sometimes people um, don't really know who we are. Uh, so we own and operate the electricity network for across London, the east and southeast of England. Um, and you can see there from the map the, the areas that we, uh, we're responsible for. Um, but we do a lot more than just operating the network and maintaining it, making sure it's good. We do a lot of innovation because we understand that part of our job is to facilitate net zero and to really help our customers, whether they are domestic businesses, um, to in their transition towards net zero as well. And we have to enable that. And a big part of doing that is understanding who our customers are. Um, and as we go through, as we have been going through the last few years, we're, under, we're learning more and more about a different customer segments, not just people in their houses, not just businesses um, in, in large industrial sites, but also SMEs. And we realized a couple of years ago that we didn't know that much about SMEs and what they needed. So we came up with this project, White Van Plan. Um, this kind of built on five main pillars. Um, so we started off with a bit of research, really diving into who are the SMEs in our area, um, what are their needs, and we, we did that through a large document review, primary and secondary research, and really what, what that was to do is to start to enable our segmentation, understand, like, can we group different SMEs together here to understand what their specific barriers, their needs, their wants are? And that's when we started to launch our engagement. After doing our segmentation, we found a few main groups based on their, um, their vehicle usage. So we started to engage with them. We uh, did a number of surveys, engaging 1,200 SMEs and 80 key st uh, stakeholders. Uh, and really that, that led us to points four and five there, the barriers and the solutions. So identifying what are the main barriers for um, different groups of SMEs and also um, how can we help alleviate some of those barriers? Because we understand that SME, not every SMEs get grouped together largely, but very independent on how you all operate. Um, so what did we learn so far? Uh, we learned the three main areas for barriers, cost, information, and infrastructure. So cost being things like the vehicles themselves, um, the infrastructure, we all know that there's um, more that can be done with infrastructure, and we're actively looking at that. Uh, information was a big one. Learning that there was a lack of information out there for businesses in their transition to net zero, especially around electric vehicles. We knew that, that was something that we'd want to tackle. And then also the infrastructure itself. Um, and, and also speaking back to the sort of charging infrastructure that's there. So the key things that, um, so I guess what we're doing, what we're doing this year, um, we are sharing a lot of our findings with the wider industry. We want to make sure that we don't just help SMEs in our area, but we're helping them up and down the country. It's a really important thing for us. We're collaborating as much as we can with um, organizations such as the FSB. We know that we're largely unknown to a lot of SMEs right now, um, and we want to be able to help as much as we can. We've got an incredible wealth of knowledge in our teams here, uh, and we want to be able to support SMEs as much as we can. So we're doing that by collaborating. Um, we're going to be creating the SME EV hub. So this can be hosted on our website. It's a knowledge and exchange hub directly to help SMEs understand the journey to net zero for you and also um, where we come in as a business to help with that. We're not selling cars, we're not um, selling you the charge points, but we're an enormous part of the infrastructure um, that needs to go in. And we're, we are more than happy to help facilitate this. We want to give advice and we want to promote this. And then finally, supporting SMEs. So we're going to be running a number of events as well, where we can share a lot of our tailored advice, some case studies of where um, businesses have gone electric and, and what that's like. And um, also from that, is, this is a two-way process. We want to learn as much as we can from SMEs as well. Like what more can we be doing as a business to help you? Um, we are a, a regulated business. Um, yes, we our main job is keeping the lights on, but we largely do innovate as well. And we can only do as much as we know. And we want to work with SMEs through that journey. 
so that's what we've been doing with white van plan um, and we'll be releasing some documents later this month to for publishing um, as well as looking to organize some events for later this year with the fsb um, so the other thing i want to talk about is energy efficiencies um, we've done a lot of work within our business looking at heat in particular for energy efficiencies, largely around domestics um, households, but I think a lot of the, the learnings are true for businesses as well. Um, I think the key thing to keep in mind when it comes to energy efficiencies is that simple is sometimes the best answer. There doesn't need to be a silver bullet or anything too complicated. It's usually the sensible things and the things that you already know to do this. So I've got five tips here. Um, first is electric vehicles. They are um, a great way. Yes, there's the infrastructure cost to go along with it to get there, but you can save money on the servicing maintenance costs, zero vehicle excise duty, and it's cheaper to refuel than petrol or diesel cars. The next one's upgrading energy efficiency. Um, this one's, so anything that keeps heat in a property or in a building is going to save you lower your energy use and therefore save you some money on bills. So that extra insulation, draft proofing windows, and even really simple things like thicker curtains, draft um, proofing your door, they'll make a really big difference. It's a, then also there's the energy efficiency appliances. Constantly new appliances come out way more energy efficient. It doesn't ma matter what kind of business it is, whether it's um, you needing IT infrastructure, fridges, anything like that, there's always a way that you can find something a bit more energy efficient that will help reduce that demand and therefore some bills. Lighting, very similar. 15% of the average UK household's electricity consumption comes from lighting. So just using more efficient um, lighting methods, that's going to make a big difference. LEDs do make a big difference. And heating systems. So this is one slightly related to households, but over half of fuel bills in households are spent on heating and hot water alone. So having an efficient heating system is something that can really make a big difference. And I guess the final thing I'd say is um, be mindful of the, your energy use as well. The simplest things, I think, I personally remember being growing up, my parents running around telling me I need to turn all the lights off, things like that. But they do make a large difference on the energy bill. Um, having things like smart meters can really make a difference in being able to monitor that and track, I guess, your progress uh, as you go along through that. Um, the final thing I'll leave you with here is, is our heat packs. Um, I'd invite you to go and have a look uh, through that link there on our, um, and I'll send the link over to Sarah as well to put into the chat. But this, we, we developed these three um, heat packs for domestic use uh, for local authorities and for businesses. Um, and that, that should help point you in the right direction of different places to find more information. Ultimately, what we want to start doing at UKPN and what we are trying to do is push what is, is to show you where the best source of information are. It may not always be from us, but being able to access that, access that information is, I think, critical for small businesses going forward. So I'd invite you to have a look at those heat packs. They've been pulled together. There's some really useful information there, and I will put the link in the chat as well. Um, and finally, before I go, if there's anything um, that you'd like to share with us, please do. Please get in contact with us. We are more than willing to um, communicate with you and start to collaborate going forward. So thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing now. That's great, Cameron. Thank you so much. Really interesting. And finally, we've got a whole pile of questions that have come in. Um, Sat, there's one from you, and I think from Rowena as well. But let's, Sat, if you, if you want to unmute and come in and ask a question. Do you want to stop sharing, Cameron? Yeah, I'm actually just struggling to get that off the screen now. <laughs> there we go, two seconds. There we go. Brilliant. Thank you. Sat. Oh, uh, thank you. So Cameron, um, I don't know if you're able to share exactly the like the process of installing the charging points and who the different parties are that are involved in the implementation of it in terms of local authorities and delivery partners and so on and so forth. Yes. So one of the th one of the things, I guess broadly, uh, high level how it works is if you were to go and find your um, get your you've got your electric car or vehicle, um, you contact your charge point operators. 
take a step back. The first thing I'd say is depends what kind of business you're running, right? Are you trying to do um, fleets at a, a depot? Are you trying to do just at home charging? These things make a difference. At home charging is very much going to follow a similar process to what you would do for domestic. So you have your electric vehicle, you contact charge point operator to get it installed, um, and you would contact UKPN, this is a key part, to be able to get fuse upgrades to the facilities just to be able to, to power that charger. Um, and we have a 10 day turnaround guarantee. We will install something in 10 days. Um, we are committed to that. But being able to get that fuse upgrade is really important and engaging with us early. Um, if it's larger, there, if it's larger, so there's um, depot charging, then that process is slightly different. Um, you, we will need to get in contact much earlier to be able to run um, studies on our networks to understand where the capacity is and how much we'd be able to connect you to. Um, but this is, and again, that's, we want to be able to help in that journey as much as possible. So early communication is key. Um, there's some really interesting stuff on our website, um, which I'll also share after this, um, for finding where there is capacity on our network and um, to be able to upgrade to that. Um, and the final thing I would say is, it, is just to reiterate that point of it's about if we can engage as early as possible, that's important to us. We want to be as proactive as we can to go around putting fuse upgrades in place to make the journey as easy as possible. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a question from Christopher, actually, which sort of resonates with the question that I was going to ask is clearly the greater your investment, the greater your saving is going to be long term. Mm. So things like uh, trans transferring our gas powered boilers to electric boilers mm. is a is a sizable investment. Is there any sort of um, stats that we can see for return of investment in terms of these these kind of initiatives? Because I think it's really important for small businesses that, you know, if they're looking at a five year plan or do we have mm. to start looking at 10 year plans before we can start to see a return on that investment? Mm. Um, so when it comes to heating, I will, I'll, I'm going to dig out some useful information and send that across. The heat packs um, do have some, some interesting statistics within those. I personally don't know them off the top of my head. Um, my focus has been electric vehicles, but we have some, it, as part of our innovation team, we have a heat team. So there's six engineers that work all, all day or all night sometimes on, on these kinds of projects. Um, I think the best place to have a look would be um, the Energy Savings Trust website. There's some really useful information there on um, switching to electric heating and what impacts that could have on um, your actual, on, uh, in terms of those metrics. Brilliant. And right at the beginning, you were talking about the cost uh, for on your white your white van mm -hmm. plan, um, you know. And this this ties up a bit with you, Ben, because at, at the beginning there was this great scrappage scheme that uh, came out of the GLA, which supported uh, small businesses trading up their vans. But when the scrappage scheme was most active, vans were in very very short supply with mm -hmm. a great long waiting list on them. I'm wondering whether or not uh, a, whether there'd be any chance of uh, a new scrappage scheme. Um, and, you know, that would certainly help in a lot of the problems that people have with regard to the expensive outlay of new vans. So, Ben, I don't know whether or not I could come back to you on that. Yeah, so it, it's it's not necessarily my specific area in terms of the, the ULES. I mean, I think the the main thing is that the mayor has been, you know, calling on the government to offer a much better scrappage scheme, um, which, you know, the, the resources of, of TFL and the GLA are very stretched. And I think actually, you know, uh, at a national scale, we need to see uh, that that from, from government to, to be able to support people to make that change. Okay, so that's about lobby. We're talking about lobbying central government in this respect. Exactly, yeah. Um, and I think, it, you know, that's that's definitely something that, um, yeah, kind of colleagues uh, working on air quality have been, have been involved in. Right, that's brilliant. Do we, I, I, sorry, Sarah, Dominique, did I miss any questions there? I can't. No, I think you covered them all, actually, Michael. I, Rowena asked a question. Uh, I think she said. Um, which I think Ben oh. did look to answer. I think. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Have we got no no other questions? In which case, Sarah, I think I'm going to pass over to you. Can I just say thank you so much 
uh, to you all, Cameron, Ben, Paul, Sat. It's been absolutely brilliant. And I'm just going to pass over to Sarah and I'll just I'll come back at the end to close off. Yes, thank you very much. And Ito, thank you very much to Ben and Paul and Cameron and, and Sat actually, Sat for being just my daily phone call and meeting to sort of get this event together. So thank you very, very much indeed. And Dominique for sorting out all the background to this event. Um, I really, really appreciate everybody's input today and it's been extremely informative. And I just wanted to sort of highlight some next steps for everybody, some other events you may well be interested in joining us for. I know Paul mentioned the FSB Net Zero conference on the 2nd of November. I have shared the link in the chat. So please, please do save the chat before you leave this webinar event today. Um, we also have two more events in this FSB London Roundtable series. We've got next Friday, the 15th, which will be hearing stories from small businesses. And uh, the idea is that uh, SAT will be sort of talking in an in-conversation style uh, approach to that. So really informal, but come and listen and hear small business stories about how they are tackling the net zero journey and sort of any top tips that they might be able to share with you too. And then our final event of this series will be on the 22nd of October, again, 11 till 12, and that will be a, a your support session. So we'll be hearing from the Cross River Partnership, um, we'll be hearing from the uh, GLA, London Councils, Hoping, Hammersmith and Fulham Council and some other great speakers lined up to really sort of help you on your journey within your borough in the London uh, community. So thank you very much. Sorry, Sarah, thank you very much um, as ever. Um, for those of you that are possibly new to FSB events, FSB is a, a very clear partnership between our staff team that the volunteers couldn't do without. Sat and I are both volunteers on, on the volunteer network and Sarah and Dominique are on the staff network. And, you know, Dominique, thank you so much. I nearly didn't get in myself because there was some glitch on the IT systems. I don't know how that happened. But anyway, once again, thank you to the four of you for speaking and particularly Sat for you for putting this whole thing together. It's been fabulous. And I think we can be really proud of what we've been able to achieve in London. Um, and um, and I look forward to the next two weeks and of course to the the next the National Net Zero Conference in November. So keep having a look at that. And um, we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.